1985, Capcom released the first instalment within the Ghosts and Goblins franchise, a series of platform games that saw the knight Sir Arthur on a quest to rescue the princess from the clutches of a demon king. It's classic video game stuff. I still remember coming across an arcade cabinet at the local laundromat. Back then you found all the best arcade games at the laundromat. But Ghosts and Goblins in particular I remember being immediately drawn to. That bright garish artwork that adorned the whole cabinet. It was all glowing and mesmerising. I suppose the character design most likely took a few cues from medieval folklore or Japanese mythology and goofy old horror films. But I just kind of dig these designs, they strike a good balance of looking cartoonish but still a little bit creepy and sinister. There was no extreme gore or over the top violence, but instead the series relied on a very macabre twisted sense of humour. If Arthur took a single hit he would be reduced to running around in his underpants. Taking another hit would see him become a pile of bones. It's a game that I really wanted to love, but the difficulty of Ghosts and Goblins is quite legendary. You had to complete the game twice in one sitting just to see the ending. I couldn't even complete it once. Or complete any of the various home conversions I had at the time. Although saying that, it's actually a little bit easier on the Game Boy Color. Kinda wish I had this version growing up. Usually whenever I played Ghosts and Goblins I could make it as far as this red demon guy who would erratically dart about the screen and often end my game right there and then. The Red Arima, or Firebrand. The character would become synonymous with the franchise and the perfect embodiment of the series' cruel difficulty. Arguably, Firebrand felt like the real main star of Ghosts and Goblins, more so than Arthur himself. So unsurprisingly in the early 90s, Capcom decided he should appear in his very own spin-off title for the Nintendo Game Boy, Gargoyle's Quest. Now this was a game I really loved. There was just a certain appeal of being able to play as a bad guy character, or just a cool looking monster. So different compared to the other more cutesy looking Game Boy characters I was used to. The western box art did make him look kind of goofy, changing his colour scheme from red to green. Although I suppose that is a little more accurate of how he actually looks on a Game Boy. The game featured a little more storytelling than its main franchise. Set within the demon realm during a period of civil war, it was up to Firebrand to live up to his destiny of being the legendary Red Blaze and save the realm. That macabre sense of humour isn't really here and the game feels more in line with a typical RPG plot of the era. And being an early 90s Capcom production the English translation could be a little bit iffy but that just only added to the charm. The game itself played a little bit like an RPG with a mix of Metroid. There were no experience points or levelling up, but Firebrand would gradually gain new items that increased his flight capabilities and attack power. Having this huge world to explore on the Game Boy always felt like such a novel concept. There were towns and NPCs to interact with, although in reality the game is fairly linear, with only one or two branching paths, there's very little backtracking, and just a few instances of having to search for specific areas on the map. The RPG game mechanics are also kept fairly light. Collectible vials acted as the in-game currency, but there were no shops to buy equipment. Instead you spent them on a Mega Man style extra energy tank or extra lives, which were fairly hard to come by in this game. The random encounters on the field played out like a short action challenge where you had to clear out an area of enemies. And the graphics really did look exceptional for an old Game Boy title. Graphics apparently so real you'll forget it's a Game Boy game. Well, maybe not quite that extreme, but for me it was all about those detailed looking backgrounds that really were quite impressive. The character design didn't disappoint either. Huge sprites that filled the tiny Game Boy screen and the freakish looking boss characters left a bit of an impact on me. Although as impressive as they may have looked, it often came at the cost of slowdown and a lot of sprite flicker. The game is fairly tough, but thankfully it never gets too overbearing. I'd said somewhere along the lines of a Mega Man title. The checkpoints were usually fairly placed, and the more you powered up Firebrand it did feel as though the game became a little bit easier each time. Firebrand is eventually able to fly indefinitely. It is just a bit of a shame that at the height of your awesome powers the game just kind of wraps things up. And that final boss feels a little bit lame if you ask me. I remember this being a huge epic adventure in my childhood. We planned it for weeks late at night with nothing but a lamp and a Game Boy magnifier that really worked. Scrolling down dozens of passwords, this game takes password saves by the way, 
But in reality, it's only about an hour long. Funny how you remember a lot of these old games being longer than they actually were. Fortunately, Gargoyle's Quest would become a trilogy, and the NES sequel was certainly a worthy follow-up. It is kind of more of the same. It did expand on a lot of the ideas from the original, and I think it may be even better than the first. Although, personally, I was never too keen on the brighter colour palette. It certainly captured the look and the feel of the original Japanese illustrations far better than its predecessor. But for me, it just lacked a little bit of that atmosphere from playing it in black and white. Or pea soup green, rather. There was a Japan-only Game Boy port of Gargoyle's Quest 2. I think I kind of prefer how these games look on a Game Boy screen. But the one I really wanted to talk about today was the final game in the trilogy. Rounding off the trio is Demon's Crest for the Super Nintendo, and the art in this game really did leave a huge impact on me. It really is a beautiful looking game. I still remember renting it for my first time, playing it late at night. That familiar glow of the static from the television, switching on your console and the screen becomes enveloped in these roaring 16-bit flames. This huge ominous shadow slowly emerging from the fire, grinning at you, as it welcomed you to the world of Demon's Crest. Now that's a title screen. The entire game is just dripping in haunting gothic atmosphere. The graphics looked incredible for a 1994 release. Sure, Donkey Kong Country may have had those fancy computer graphics, but Demon's Crest had this almost hand-drawn style quality to its visuals. And even now, the pixel art has managed to stand the test of time. I still find myself being completely absorbed in these backgrounds. On the downside, maybe Demon's Crest was a little too style over substance. I reckon it has a few flaws that prevented it from being truly great. The difficulty in particular felt all over the place. If you're struggling with an area or a particular boss, you can often just come back later when you've acquired one of your new powers, and suddenly it's laughably easy. At first glance, that Mode 7 Final Fantasy style overworld that stretches out before you feels massive. It's incredibly exciting. That is, until you realise it's actually much smaller than it appears, and it's nothing more than a very decorative looking level select. Demon's Crest is beautiful, and I am pretty grateful to at least own a copy. It's one of my favourite games on the Super Nintendo. But I think I still prefer Gargoyle's Quest 1 and 2, personally. All three games did feel like a bit of an uneven trilogy, if I'm honest. They're solid titles, but they just never seem to quite reach the same heights as some of the other action platformers, always overshadowed by something else. But nevertheless, this little trilogy of games has always stuck with me. From their great atmosphere and awesome looking character designs, it really does make you kind of wish Capcom would resurrect the series. The characters do at least live on, with both Arthur and Firebrand representing the franchise within the Ultimate Edition of Marvel vs. Capcom 3. And I must admit, I still find myself firing up these old games and just giving them another playthrough. I may just do that now. Well then, that's it for me today. Thank you for watching, and I hope I see you all again next time. Take care.